Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for not falling asleep after lunch. So good to see you all. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself before I start talking about the talk, uh, my name is Seal. I work at the uh, Threat Intelligence Analysis Group at Checkpoint. I've uh, been there for three years. And I mainly, well, most of my work focuses on Middle East stuff. Um, and this talk is no different. Uh, actually, this talk has a lot to do with Libya. Um, and if you don't know where the country of Libya is, it's actually right in the middle of this map. I made it a bit easy. Uh, it's in North Africa. But uh, Libya has a very interesting history because back in the day, it was ruled by a king. And in 1969, that king was abroad in Turkey and Greece, supposedly to receive some medical treatment. And there was a revolution against him. And that revolution succeeded quite easily. There wasn't a lot of resistance to it. And then someone else rose to power, someone by the name of Gaddafi. Um, and Gaddafi became a bit of an internet celebrity, if you've been following for the recent years. But uh, before that, he was uh, really the voice of change in Libya. He wanted to get rid of the corrupt kingdom. He wanted to overthrow the tyrant. He turned the country into a republic. And because he was such an advocate of change, he only ruled for 40 years. And by the end of that, he didn't even go willingly. Uh, because in 2011, that was actually the peak of the Arab Spring. So all over countries in the Middle East, there were protests asking the rulers and the dictators to step down and to improve the living circumstances within those countries. And the political chaos started from Tunisia, that's where the protests uh, first began, and then spread most notably to Egypt and Syria, but the, it also reached Libya as well, and eventually uh, Gaddafi was overthrown and killed. Uh, and the situation didn't improve much after that. Uh, there was even a council that was supposed to choose a replacement for Gaddafi, but they failed. And they also failed to prevent a second civil war that happened in Libya in uh, 2017. Uh, and since that day, or nowadays, there are two major people in power in Libya. There is a prime minister... Uh, which leads a government that the UN approves of, and there is a general marshal of the Libyan National Army, so he leads the rebel powers against that prime minister. And I gave you that kind of boring historic, intro boring historic introduction into Lib in Libya because uh, this dude, the general marshal, or by his real name, uh, Haftar, appeared in an interesting context. A Facebook page that was using his name. Um, and that page was created, I think, in March, and it was sharing posts like this one. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can tell from this post. First off, we see that it had 5,000 reactions, so a lot of people were exposed to this post. A lot of people saw it and engaged with it. Uh, it was promising mobile applications um, that were could, could have been downloaded by the link that it offers, and they were uh, supposedly uh, providing the users with the latest news from Libya. Uh, but in truth, they, of course, had malware, and they were malicious. Um, so I was really curious just coming across this post randomly, uh, going through stuff on Facebook, and I wanted to dig a bit deeper into this and find out more about this attack. And this page, all of the posts that were shared by it were like this one, so uh, they were sharing malicious links to malicious files. And so one of the first questions I asked myself coming across this post uh, and trying to investigate this further was, are the attackers using other ways to spread this malware? Is this the only page? Did the malicious activity start just now, or has this been going on for a while? Uh, and to answer that, one of the first ways that I've used was the Facebook search bar. So I used that to look up some of the links that were, downloaded the that were downloading the malicious files and that were seen in the posts by this page. And doing that, I got back nothing. Uh, and if you're, if you're uh, familiar with the Facebook search bar or you have uh, extensive stalking experience, you would know that not a lot of the times uh, it doesn't really give back the most accurate uh, results. Even when you know a post is there, you don't always get it back. And uh, that wasn't probably the most effective way to check this. But then I realized that the posts included something else besides the links downloading the files. They included text. 
Uh, and that text was in Arabic, and I speak Arabic, and I can tell you that text was so shitty that I even created a version of the post with all of the grammatical mistakes and wrong syntax and weird phrasing highlighted. You can see it's kind of like a very high percentage of the post, and I roughly translated that into English with the mistakes. You can kind of feel or see how I felt reading this um, and seeing this text in the post itself. But this can tell me two things. First off, I can tell that whoever wrote this text is an Arabic speaker because they didn't really use a translating engine or a Google Translator or whatever to generate this because even though that might sometimes mess up the message you're trying to convey, Google Translate will give you back the word uh, army with double A or two with a U, etc. And second of all, I can use that in my advantage. So if I can find those uh, uniquely wrong mistakes, again, being repeated elsewhere, I can probably say that it was the same person who made that mistake. And so I did that, and this time around, when I looked up uh, some of the Arabic phrases that I saw in the posts, I got back results. And I actually got back many, many, many results using this technique. Uh, and you can see that all of the results here also follow the same pattern, so it's just a small caption and then a link leading to a malicious file. And soon enough I realized that each link was shared by more than one page. So we can really see the same text here, the same caption of the post, and the same link copied in multiple places on the same day. So I soon realized that each such link had the potential of exposing multiple related pages. And then those pages, as I was going through them, revealed more links. And the links connected me to more pages, and then those pages connected back to the same links. So again, I realized I could kind of create a network here of URLs and Facebook pages, uh, and I did that, and this is the full version of it all, and it's very ugly, it's zoomed out, you can't tell anything about it, but this is kind of the full Maltego graph, of the graph of the whole thing, connecting all of the uh, pages and the URLs, but we can really see how interconnected this is, and looking at the connections, we can tell that each link Link was most of the links were shared more, more than once by the different pages that were involved in this attack. Um, and again, just by mapping the whole thing, I was able to tell that the activity goes back to at least 2014. That's the earliest instance I have seen relating to this activity, so it has been going on for quite a while when I came across this. Um, I was also able to tell that there are approximately 40 pages that were involved in this uh, operation and uh, that were being used to share the malicious posts. And I saw that this had a very wide outreach because eventually some of the pages that I came across and I was able to connect to this had tens of thousands of followers and even two of them had more than 100,000 followers. So you can imagine that each uh, post that was prompting victims to download a malicious file had the potential of reaching thousands or tens of thousands of people each time through one individual page. Um, and we can ask ourselves, well, who is this after? Who are the attackers trying to target using this? And you might have wild guess, uh, but we were able to get more solid evidence about the victims because actually all of the posts, or most of them, were using uh, link shortening services. So a lot of Google short links and bit.ly and tiny URL. And what's great about those links is that they store statistics. So I can see how many times they were clicked, where from, and more information about that. So in the link I'm showing here, for example, we can see that it was created, Around the time it was created, it was clicked around 7,000 times, um, and that was also around the time it was shared. And that's a very high number as well, but we can also see that most of the time the victims or the people that clicked this link were referred to it by Facebook. So we know that this is the major uh, attack vector for this campaign. Um, and out of the 7,000 clicks, 5,000 clicks came from, surprise, surprise, Libya. Um, and there were some 
victims, supposedly, or some other clicks from different countries, but we can really see the focus on this country uh, by this attack. And uh, again, disclaimer, a click does not mean a successful infection, so these are just numbers of clicks. We don't know if they were victims eventually, but we can really see the focus on Libya, uh, even in terms of uh, links here. And the same pages that were involved in the malicious activity shared other posts as well. So we also saw them sharing uh, updates about things that were going on in Libya and news. And that kind of followed the same pattern. So the same post with the same caption and picture was copied across multiple pages. Um, and seeing this, I was very uh, surprised. I, first off, I thought it was trying to push kind of uh, hidden propaganda or agenda and uh, maybe trying to influence some people. But in reality, these were just news updates that were trying to keep the uh, followers of the pages engaged and trying to keep them uh, following the pages themselves and just um, to eventually click the malicious links and increase the page's legitimacy. So this wasn't really trying to uh, politically affect anyone's opinion, I would say. Um, and another question. I was asking myself, and you might be, uh, is why, why were the attackers using Facebook? Why this social network? So in Libya, but also in other countries where there is a lot of uh, political conflict, I would say, sometimes your uh, mainstream media or your main media outlets, the official news channels and the official newspapers, are not the best source to get your news. Uh, so a lot of the times you would uh, be thinking you're seeing uh, what's really going on when in fact uh, what you're following or the channel is really giving you kind of a biased idea of what is going on and they're taking just one side. Um, and because of that, a lot of people uh, in the Middle East region but also in different places have turned to other sources for news, uh, and it involves obviously online websites and online blogs, but also Facebook. So Facebook has become kind of a very reliable way for people to get their news from. And as soon as the victims realized that, as soon as the people realized that, threat actors were very quick to follow. So we also see that in a lot of the misinformation campaigns that have been exposed recently, Facebook has played a very major role. Uh, and actually, such a campaign that was exposed by Facebook th themselves, so by the uh, Facebook company, uh, that was affecting countries such as Sudan and Libya, uh, it was... They discovered that the attackers behind this attack invested nearly $100,000 in advertising trying to reach the people uh, or the citizens of Libya and other countries and uh, affect them or trying to kind of humiliate one leader and promote another. So again, we really see uh, how important Facebook is in the threat landscape in the Middle East also in terms of misinformation campaigns, but also in terms of malware. So we've seen some of the more advanced players, like uh, if you know of the uh, Dark Caracal threat group, but also, oh, no, okay, sorry. Uh, if you know of the Dark Caracal threat group and uh, APTC23, for example, so we have also seen them uh, spreading their malicious samples using Facebook. So these are just two examples of uh, groups that they have uh, used or pages that they've used to reach a wide audience of victims. And even in our case, like although the posts uh, or the news headlines that the pages shared weren't really trying to uh, do something like behind the stage or affect people, but we can still see that updating and sharing those news about Libya in those pages did keep the users engaged and it was kind of a nice way to keep them uh, following the pages. Um, and since we've mentioned uh, malware here and uh, malicious files, you might again also be wondering what was the malware that was used in this campaign. Um, so it wasn't very, very impressive, I would say. Uh, the attackers in this case were using kind of off-the-shelf tools, so known remote administration tools for both mobile and desktop, so they were attacking the two vectors. In the case of mobile, we saw that a lot of the times they were using Spynote, which again kind of provides the attacker with, with a nice panel uh, that can let them control basically anything on the infected device and exfiltrate all the information, like contacts, calls, and uh, more sensitive stuff as well. Uh, and in terms of desktop, so it was a lot of NJRAT and 
other things that the attackers didn't really develop themselves. So they, again, didn't waste a lot of time on developing their own malware. Uh, and in case of desktop, they did add some protective layers before delivering the uh, payload eventually. So we can see that when the victims would download the file or when they would click the link, they at first would be uh, or would receive a VBS file or a WSF file. Uh, and you can even see that the name of the file itself looks like a news headline. So just to keep uh, the theme of the posts going on and to convince the victims that, oh, this is okay, you should click this, you should run this on your machine. Uh, and then opening up the VBS file again, uh, we can see that it has this sort of random blob at first but it's not really, uh, you can tell that this is just a comment, it's not really part of the code and it's just used to hide uh, the beginning of the VBS code which is uh, down at the bottom. So it's just meant to confuse any victim who attempts to open this file. And the purpose of the VBS is just basically take an array of decimal values and turn it into the corresponding ASCII characters and uh, eventually reverse that string. And now we can see that we get a more readable code in this case and we still have um, an encoded uh, bit at the end and that is base64 encoded and which is in this case the payload, the executable payload. So the purpose of the VBS is to kind of uh, prepare for the payload to be executed on the machine. And uh, the payload itself was a .NET executable, again also something open source off the shelf, not something that the attacker developed. And it was supposed to gather information from the infected device, so again like the IP address, the installed antivirus products, etc. And upload all of that to a CNC address. Um, and that CNC address helped me answer the question of who is behind this attack. Because basically, the, uh, this website or this CNC used DuckDNS or dynamic DNS, so it resolved to a lot of IP addresses. And then going over, the, going over those IP addresses, I saw that uh, one of them was associated with another domain. And that domain was used by this campaign back in 2017, so it was the CNC for other files that were spread by the Facebook pages. And uh, that other domain, unlike the DRPC.DNS, uh, it had who is information. And the who is information showed me a name that I couldn't really get a lot of information on online, but it also had an email address, which again repeated the DRPC that we see in the other website. And looking up this email address, I also saw that it was used to register to other addresses, DexterLY.com and DexterLY.space. And Searching for Dexter LY actually led me to a Facebook profile operated by the attacker. So Dexter LY was the current avatar of the attacker behind this campaign. And the, his previous avatar, as it turns out, was Dr. PC, which we've seen in the uh, new website address and in the uh, Gmail um, email that was used for uh, registering them. And this Facebook profile, I mean, if you've looked at similar attacks, it kind of follows the pattern of attackers of the sort. He was uh, basically flexing about all of the achievements uh, and everything that he did and all of the systems he managed to infiltrate and basically sharing panels of showing successful infections and uh, victims that he managed to get uh, to run the application. and. What was a bit weird for me at least, observing a lot of similar threats uh, in the region is that usually uh, those kind of threat actors would be like, oh, like, look at the credit cards I managed to steal or look at the PayPal account I got into and it's more, uh, it's, it's more about bragging in that sense, but this guy was actually sharing a lot more sensitive information. So over the years, I think he managed to infect thousands of people, uh, mostly from Libya, and apparently he also got his hands on a lot of sensitive information by doing that. 
So we saw that using this Facebook profile, he also used to share a lot of confidential documents that were uh, shared by the Libyan embassies and the Libyan government and internal information that wasn't supposed to reach his hands or anyone else. And you can even see him kind of uh, getting his hands on communications between uh, international companies and the Libyan government as well. So this was really... Uh, kind of surprising to see that despite the basic tools he was using, this was very, very successful and did a lot of harm, actually. And he even uh, shared some official documents and uh, on his Facebook profile, so we can even see that he got his hands on a couple of uh, copies of diplomatic passports, which is funny because this, the, uh, the one on the right actually belongs to the general marshal, to the guy from the initial Facebook page. So somehow, by infecting some guy's device, he uh, got a copy of the diplomatic passport of uh, this guy. Um, and that was crazy, and uh, seeing just the scope of this attack was, uh, again, also crazy, and we've reported all of this activity to Facebook, so uh, luckily the Dexter LY profile is down nowadays, all of the pages that were involved are down, and uh, again, this guy, some of his activity, even back in the day, and I realized this later on, was also uh, uncovered by Trend Micro, I think back in 2017, but he's, it, that didn't deter him. They still uh, kept at it, and uh, this time we took more strict means in terms of uh, trying to stop him from doing what he's doing, and I really hope uh, he doesn't go back to uh, doing that eventually, because uh, he, he was also sharing f f the fact that he received emails by the FBI letting him know that they're aware of uh, his malicious activity, but I think as long as he stays within Libya, he's going to be off the hook, but just hopefully not doing anything malicious anymore. Um, so to conclude, uh, this activity has been going on for years, I think even more than 2014. This goes back to uh, way before that in, uh, in the previous profiles that I've seen also operated by him. He was uh, kind of uh, also active in 2013 in all different, uh, in different hacking activities. And he was using off-the-shelf tools, and I think if you're uh, kind of working in threat intelligence or in malware analysis and whatever, that makes our job in terms of attribution a bit harder because if he's using his own unique code, that's uh, kind of better for us to track his tools and to know what is going on there and to uh, be able to tell when he uh, releases new samples, for example. But just knowing that he's using things like Spynote or NGRAT makes it, makes it a bit harder. And I think looking at the alternative of identifying this guy simply by his... Uh, grammar mistakes and uh, seeing tracking this activity by his typos was a nice alternative in this case that uh, would have been harder if, uh, if we were just doing this uh, simply by looking at the malicious samples. So uh, in terms of threat intelligence techniques, this also kind of provided me at least with a new way of looking at things and not just looking at the malicious code, but also sometimes it's more simple than that. You don't only have to rely on the sample itself. Um, and despite the low sophistication of those things and the fact that he was using those open source tools, we can really see the high impact of these attacks. And I think this really applies to a lot of threats in the Middle East. Uh, the fact that they are not very sophisticated, I mean, there are the very sophisticated ones, don't get me wrong. But despite the fact that they're not very complex, we can really still see them doing very, very high, like a lot of damage, uh, simply because they know how to socially engineer their samples, they know how to reach their victims, and they know how to, to design the bait for uh, the people that they are targeting. So in this case, we really see the investment of this guy and the usage of those Facebook pages with thousands of followers and trying to keep them as legitimate as possible and uh, succeeding throughout all of that into reaching uh, all of those people and not really by investing a lot of effort uh, on the technical side. So I would say that, and this maybe repeats what Brian said earlier in the day, that you don't really have to have the most advanced tools for you to have the severe impact that this campaign had. And that'd be all for me. Thank you.